Welcome to the Men's Divorce Podcast, presented by the domestic litigation firm Cordell & Cordell, a partner men can count on. Now, here's your host, managing partner and CEO of Cordell & Cordell, Scott Trout. Today, we want to tackle uh, modifying orders of alimony, uh, or commonly referred to around the country, maintenance or spousal support. Like last month, I am once again joined by the Cordell and Cordell attorneys, Rachel Schmidt in our Edwardsville, Illinois office, and Dylan Briggs in our St. Charles, Missouri office. Thanks for uh, joining me again this month, guys. Thank you for having us. Good morning. So. Um, Again, uh, like we spoke last time, uh, there's just so many different variances, and I mean a lot when it relates to the payment of spousal support month or uh, state to state. I mean, the laws are different, the application's different, uh, the enforcement's different. So, I mean, it's such a huge topic for guys because they're just many of them in the states that I practiced, predominantly in Missouri and Georgia, and I am licensed in Illinois, but. There just was no way to give guidance, much guidance to guys. But some states are starting to adopt very specific calculable uh, methods to determine the amount of spousal support if there is any. So perhaps let's start there. The best way, and, and before we get into how do we modify it, let's talk about how it's created, the how it's determined in, in kind of your states and I know every guy is going to have to Google some of this and then go to some of our websites at men's divorce and dad's divorce.com to find out some more information. But how is it calculated in your respective states or how is it determined and arrived at at the onset of a divorce? So either one. So in Illinois, um, effective January 1st of 2015, there is a new statute. Um, and I say that just because if you're Googling information, make sure that you're looking at articles uh, cases that have happened after that deadline because the prior law is no longer um, applicable. So what happens in Illinois in regards to maintenance is that there is a there's a calculation. Mm -hmm. um, and basically how the courts calculate maintenance is that they take 30% of the higher payer's gross income, and that's income from all sources, and they subtract out then the lower uh, payers income the spouse is 20 percent of their gross income and then whatever that difference is that is the yearly support for maintenance now one caveat is that the person receiving maintenance cannot receive more than 40 percent of the total income of the parties 40 percent of gross 40 percent of the gross so is there an ability to impute income to the recipient spouse? Or is that often? I mean, I know I'm sure there's an ability. Is that something that is done often? So in, in the statute, it is written that there are some very um, variables that the court should look at before ordering this calculation. And one of those, there's about 14 factors. And one of, some of those factors include the income, current income, uh, the potential income. So there is an argument for imputing income. Practically speaking, I've not seen it done. Mm -hmm. I've seen, um, and I have had judges tell me, listen, I'm not going to impute income. This is what the parties, this was the past practice of the parties. A lot of times you might have a stay-at-home mom or you might have somebody who's only working part-time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've even argued, hey, they can, the kids are getting older. They can go back to school and work full-time. And I've had judges, you know, point blank say, no, this is, this is what the this is what the parties have been doing, mm -hmm. and this is how we're going to calculate support. Okay. Um, so that number then is dependent upon whether or not it's going to be permanent maintenance or temporary maintenance, and that's dependent upon the length of the marriage. And there's a calculation for that as well in Illinois. So you basically take, if you've been married from zero to five years, mm -hmm. you take it the length of the marriage times uh, point two, and that's how long then you pay the maintenance. If you've been married five to ten years, you take the length of the marriage times four or times point four. If you've been married ten to fifteen years, you take the length of the marriage times point six. From fifteen to twenty years, you take the length of the marriage times point eight. 
And then anything over 20 years, you are technically looking at permanent maintenance or the length of the marriage. So if you've been married 25 wow. years, you're paying maintenance for 25 years. So don't move to Illinois. Don't move to <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> As I get ready get to out of Illinois. my 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so, um, so Dylan, uh, the standards and kind of uh, how is it uh, developed in Missouri? Missouri is uh, very different and much less regimented. This is not another one of those instances where judges have an immense degree of discretionary power. So uh, generally speaking in Missouri, uh, a spouse is only going to be entitled to receive maintenance or spousal support if she lacks sufficient property, he or she lacks sufficient property or income to provide for her reasonable needs, his or her reasonable needs and maintain that standard of living. Um, and then as far as the amount of maintenance is concerned, the uh, statutes in Missouri have a list of factors. I, I believe there are 10 of them, mm -hmm. uh, but those factors are of you know, limited impact for the reason that the 10th factor is any other relevant factor can be taken into account for making a maintenance determination. But uh, some of the most uh, prevalent factors that judges take into account are the length of the marriage, the income of the parties or the earning capacity mm -hmm. of the parties if they don't have any income, um, and the amount of time that it will be necessary for the party receiving spousal support or maintenance to attain self-sufficiency such that that maintenance or spousal support obligation is no longer needed. And um, somewhat differently from Illinois, uh, income is imputed in Missouri with a reasonable degree of regularity, particularly in instances where one of the spouses has no employment whatsoever. And in that mm -hmm. case, it's it's very easy for a party to impute at least minimum wage to that unemployed spouse. So and when we talk about the modification of maintenance, again, or alimony or spousal support, we get caught in, again, again, this stereotype of, oh, it's, you know, it's going to be the guy that's being the, the pay or spouse. But and I like to refer to it as manimony. Uh, there are guys who get alimony, and there are guys that should be getting alimony. You know, there's varying statistics that suggest that about 20-some percent of guys that are going through divorce are uh, what I call alimony eligible, meaning that they, you know, the facts support them, but only about 6% uh, get it. And I think that's typically due to some of the stereotypes that exist that we try to fight. But So I want to keep that in mind as we... Uh, talk about it because guys out there may be saying, look, I'm the one that wants to increase the alimony because I'm getting it or I'm afraid that it's going to be terminated. So I want to talk it, and from both perspectives where guys are both the payor and the payee. So the big question is for many guys is can I modify the order of maintenance uh, or alimony? And if so, what should I be looking for? And, and maybe as a guy, before I go see my lawyer, what are some of the things where that would suggest that I go talk to a lawyer about modifying, whether it's to decrease, to increase, or to terminate, if you can. And and perhaps, as you suggested earlier, Rachel, it may be no termination, but I want to talk a little bit about those things and what we should be looking for in either one. So the first thing I would say to do is look at the original order um, and see if there's any language in there regarding if it's reviewable, mm -hmm. if, it's, if, you, if it terminates on a drop-dead date, Check, start there and see um, what language, if any language is in there. Um, in Illinois, it, it, there are different types of reviewable maintenance, non-reviewable maintenance. And the other thing that we have to kind of keep in mind here as well in Illinois is that there have been some orders that we might be trying to modify now that were entered prior mm. to this January 2015 date and some that are we're trying to modify after. So those are things to kind of keep in mind and you can talk to your attorney in regards to how that applies to modification. But if there's a reviewable word, mm -hmm. if that says reviewable, then what you wanna start looking for is um, a substantial change of circumstance. Um, and even if it doesn't say reviewable, you still may be able to review um, or modify mm -hmm. that award as well. Um, so in, in those circumstances, you're still looking for a substantial change of circumstance. And those can include a, um, you know, retirement, uh, medical issues, um, um, you know, loss of wages, um, things that terminate maintenance in Illinois are cohabitation of the other party, mm -hmm. uh, 
remarriage of the other party. Those are issues of terminating and maintenance. So that's kind of what you want to look for. Okay. And Dylan, uh, Missouri, when a client comes in, kind of what are you looking for? What are you asking the, the client um, to try to, to analyze just very quickly? And I know it requires a much more in-depth analysis, but what are you looking for particularly? Uh, I'm looking for that change in circumstance that was just referenced moments ago and any facts that can substantiate our argument that that stain, change in circumstance has transpired. So uh, the first thing that you have to do is figure out what the original circumstance was. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can, once that is identified, start to evaluate whether or not a change has in fact occurred. And you're looking for many of the same things that were also just referenced, you know, mm -hmm. changes in expenses, changes in income, um, remarriage, cohabitation. Uh, in Missouri, there is not uh, the statutory provision that it seems that there is in Illinois where if uh, a spouse receiving maintenance starts to cohabitate with another person, then maintenance or spousal support stops. That's not the way that it is in Missouri. But that cohabitation can be useful because if by cohabitating with this other person, the spouse's expenses have been decreased precipitously, then her need mm -hmm. for maintenance has been decreased. And so that may substantiate a motion to modify the maintenance obligation in a downward deviation. So on the standard, one of the things I know that clients have asked me, we talk about substantial change w from when and you know, from what mark. So I presume in both you would say, and correct me, is the substantial change is from the date of the decree, uh, the divorce decree? Right? Yes. Yeah. So and it has to be substantial and continuing, so it can't be a temporary change, like a, you know, a, a temporary layoff, so it's something more permanent? Yes, correct. that's correct. Okay. And a lot of times it has to be, let's say, a, a change in employment. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll have people come in and say, I want to I want to get a new job. Mm -hmm. uh, my hours are going to be better, but guess what? My income's going to go down. That's going to be a hard sell to get that modification approved. Um, if you're voluntarily reducing your income, um, even though it might be for the betterment of you and your family, a lot of times the judges are still going to set that modification. Unless you have another reason, mm -hmm. they're going to deny that modification. So how does custody come into play? Let's say, say I've had historically firefighters, uh, and their hours are all over the board. Uh, you know, they may be three on, you know, four off, four on, three off, whatever it may be, five on, 15 days on, you know, um, and their schedule is so erratic when they have kids, and that is very difficult to have a meaningful, regular, consistent schedule. Uh, because every month it changes. So how does that come into play when, let's say, a guy who has, maybe he works a graveyard shift, and in order to um, have more time with his kids, he wants to change his job, uh, but it's going to affect his pay. Does that come into play? Uh, is that something that can be considered by the court when uh, looking at perhaps modifying? Because if he takes a different job, he can't afford the maintenance. So is that something the court will look at? It's absolutely something the court would look at in Missouri, and off the top of my head, it's probably the only excuse that a court is going to accept for willfully mm -hmm. decreasing your income as far as you know, justifying a downward deviation in a spousal support obligation. Uh, typically, any voluntary reduction uh, in income is not a factor to be considered mm -hmm. uh, whenever trying to modify a um, spousal support obligation to the extent that it's true of retirement also. So uh, even when you've worked for 30 years and you've been paying spousal support on time every time for the exact right amount for 10 years and you've gotten to the age where retirement is appropriate, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes you're still going to have to ensure that you can meet that maintenance obligation when making that decision of the right time to retire. Yeah, I mean, I've got kind of clients that come in, uh, they may be working for Boeing or you know, some of the larger companies where their pension is structured where they can retire early in their early 50s and they don't have to work but they're like well, can i retire what's your answer look at the order mm -hmm. and if it says i mean depending on what it says but in illinois it is hard to get that modification um of a downward maintenance order once mm -hmm. it's entered yeah. and so back to the the fireman example too i would say when you're going through that divorce, change your hours now. Mm -hmm. And and I know not that can't happen always, but it is hard in Illinois to get a modification based on something that's already happening. Um, they they look at it and they say this is 
this was happening when you got when you got divorced. Um, you know, this was happening for ten years prior to your marriage. Mm-hmm. So that is really what the courts look at. Um, and the same thing for the the Boeing engineer and and yeah. the retirement. You know, well, this is your income, and um, if you can perhaps look at the other factors um, and maybe you know kind of have some other arguments, you might have a better. Uh, standing, but it is if that's in and of itself, and you're retiring early, you probably need to factor in that mm-hmm. higher amount of of maintenance. So, what I call springing orders, meaning that you know, good tip for guys is try to address some of these issues at the divorce. You know, uh, create an order by which, okay, at age 50, the maintenance goes to this. At age 60, the maintenance goes to this. Now. And there's some risks associated with it, obviously, because you're committing yourself to a dollar amount, you know, down the road. But I've had clients where they know they're retiring at 51, period, and they're, you know, they're in the early 40s. And so, rather than risk trying to go back to court in hopes that the court agrees, we just created an, a, a an automatic modification, a self-modifying order that says she'll draw a pension equal to this, and therefore it's dollar for dollar reduction. I think that's the biggest, the greatest tip I can give guys when it comes to alimony and maintenance, regardless of the state in which you're in, unless it's one where it's just a absolute term, is to just be proactive. Think about what may be. Start putting in orders in expectation of, you know, retirement and what will it look like and or a de-escalating amount of maintenance over time. You know, it's okay to just do, you know, 5,000, 4,000, 2,000, you know, where it basically runs itself out. So that would be the biggest tip, I think, because it is. It's so problematic. It's for me, um, even though Illinois now has a formula, which Missouri does not, that is probably the greatest problem is there's no guidance. Um, It oftentimes becomes an order of permanence where I've taken cases up to the appellate court before We've won at the trial level only to lose at the appellate court, where essentially it becomes a lifetime award. And so I think when I tell guys that are looking that they may be faced with a payment, and that is they need to be assuming it's a lifetime award. And let's make some provisions for retirement. Let's make some provisions for uh, education to force, you know, mom back into the system and get retrained and those types of things. So when we talk about retirement, and I know it's a sticky subject and it's uh, it's so very state to state but what happens when let's say I had a case uh, a few uh, months ago where mom is substantially older um, and she is going to start drawing Social Security years before a client I think my client was 52 and she was 60 what happens is that open the door for a modification if she starts drawing Social Security and pension and her 401k and she can she can voluntarily start pulling it in Missouri, that's going to depend. So uh, it depends on where that Social Security money is coming from. Was that coming from time that mother paid into the Social Security system after the divorce? Because if so, then yes, that would justify uh, a maintenance reduction. But let's say that mom was a stay-at-home mom and the Social Security that she's drawing is being uh, what was accrued by her husband's employment while they were married, then in Missouri, that could be interpreted as uh, contemplated in the original property distribution, and so that may not be uh, used to justify a reduction in a maintenance obligation. Mm-hmm. Illinois? As long as it's under the term of a reviewable maintenance. So again, going mm-hmm. back to that original order, whether it says it or even if it's silent and you can make that argument that it's reviewable as long as it doesn't say yeah. you know, non-reviewable, then yes, her income um, from Social Security would be something that could be considered at, at you know, as uh, asking to modify it. Mm-hmm. So, but a lot of times what happens is years go past, her income, she might have more income, but a lot of times your income has gone up as well. Mm-hmm. And so you have to balance filing a modification based on her income and look at yours as well. Right. And there's some keywords I know, at least in Missouri, it's modifiable and non-modifiable. And that's, you know, you're faced with that decision. If you settle your case in the front end, do I make it non-modifiable? I mean, I think there are very limited circumstances in which I do that. I mean, I've seen so many orders where it's non-modifiable for life. That's, to me, that's a mistake no matter what. But um, 
we have those conversations. If it's termed out, you know, in four or five years and it's non-modifiable, we can talk through the risks. But that's the first word I'm looking for is, is it reviewable? Is it modifiable? Um, I can tell you many clients I've had to, you know, have them leave because I said, there's nothing I can do here because the way that it was drafted at the time of your divorce, it either makes it impossible or it's just not allowable. And so that's kind of the first place I'd start is the language of the order itself. Does it provide for a review or a modification? So we talked about remarriage. Is it um, is that something automatic in, in your experience that remarriage will automatically trigger a uh, termination or modification of the alimony maintenance? It terminates in Illinois, yes. Yeah. Missouri? Yes, in Missouri, death and remarriage automatically okay. terminate okay. a spousal support obligation. And then, you know, cohabitation, you know, is becoming the, the percentages, and all the studies show that marriage is decreasing. And with this generation, uh, cohabitation is increasing. Um, and so the question becomes is how difficult is it to use cohabitation in your practice to, to do so, to try to prove either a termination or a reduction? Because let's make the assumption that whoever they're cohabiting with is paying some of the bills. So if you can do it, what evidence do you need? And what does a guy need to prove in order to be success or to successfully use cohabitation? So I think in Illinois, what you really want to do is prove what I would say is true cohabitation, where both parties only have this one residence. Um, it's not as where the the other um, person has their residence and they spend the night there maybe 60% of the time. That's going to be extremely difficult to prove. They're probably doing that just so you can continue to have to pay maintenance. Right. Um, you need, you know, driver's license, change of address, um, you know, um, anything that shows the change of address. And so those kinds of where they really just have one true address, one true home, that's going to be showing cohabitation. It's the exact same thing in Missouri, except that, you know, you were really only trying to use it to demonstrate a diminishment in the expenses that that receiving spouse, <clears throat> excuse me, has incurred. So uh, the more de uh, not dependent that the uh, former spouse is on his or her new significant other, mm -hmm. the better in terms of um, decreasing that maintenance obligation. So... Uh, medical reasons. Uh, I've had a client uh, who's an orthopedic surgeon. Over the years, all the standing, it, it started to have an effect on his back. And so he got to a point where he had some uh, degeneration or degradation of um, his spine and it prohibited him from doing his job. Uh, in your experience, is something like that, what medical reasons can guys use uh, to seek a modification? Uh, or a termination of their maintenance or alimony payments. And conversely, can, and I was warn my clients, when you seek to modify downward or terminate, they always expect a modification from your ex-spouse to increase. So is that your uh, experience as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And so have you all been faced with something where a client's saying, here's my medical condition, can I seek to modify? Yes, I have. And the next phrase out of my mouth is, do you have medical opinion? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, as we all know, you you might not feel like you can work that much or your body is just, you know, after experiencing, you know, years of living, you, you're, you don't feel like working that much. And I understand that, but your testimony to the judge isn't going to hold anything. You need a medical expert. You need somebody to testify, um, maybe you're on uh, workers comp or you've been on you know, disability, something along those lines where we have that third party to come in and testify. They can't work these hours. They can't mm -hmm. work this job anymore. Um, you're not making that choice. Um, that is where you're going to have success in a modification or a termination. Yeah. Uh, a liability in that exact scenario is also uh, when the limiting injury accrued. So if this has been a longstanding chronic issue that mm -hmm. existed at the time that the original maintenance obligation was imposed, and then, you know, five years down the line, the client has just kind of decided that it, it hurts too bad at this point and cannot work anymore, then even if he has that medical evidence mm -hmm. from a doctor or from workman's comp or something like that, a judge may still say, well, you were able to work then and you still have this maintenance obligation and she still needs this or he still needs this maintenance obligation. So 
um, I'm going to, even if you lose that income because you've decided to stop working, I'm going to impute that income right back to you. And so you're still going to have the same obligation and you're not going to have the income that you had before to meet that obligation. So how much does lifestyle uh, choice in terms of spending and vacations and buying luxurious items on with the maintenance you know that's a complaint guys will come in and say hey look she's going to Puerto Vallarta she's going to Paris she's bought herself a new Cadillac uh, using all my money and she's not working so how much does her lifestyle come into play from a court's perspective when a guy wants to seek to modify maintenance, will they look at it? Will they look at gambling, vacations, what she's spending her money on? Does that matter at all? So in Illinois, um, I have to go back to that formula. Mm. It, it, although lifestyle is one of those factors that the court can consider, a lot of times the courts, in my experience, have just looked at that at that formula. And even a modification, they go back and they look at that formula. If they find, first they have to find, mm -hmm. if you're asking for a modification, you have to show that there's a substantial change of circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the court says, yep, okay, there is a change of circumstance, but now we're looking at this formula. Mm -hmm. And it, it really comes down to that. Interesting. So I know in Missouri, one of the cases I tried was a, with this uh, surgeon, we put on display really in, in her lifestyle in terms of she received about a, you know a substantial amount of money at the divorce and during the course of trial the point we wanted to raise was she had literally blown through all of it all of her savings all of her retirement all of the cash on things that were luxurious trips cars electronics jewelry gifts to others and so to to show that look she did doesn't need more money because she had the money and she just decided to blow it. So does that, I mean, Dylan, you think in your experience, have you seen that where judges are receptive to a lifestyle argument in terms of what I'll refer to as financial waste? Yes and no. Um, I mean, you certainly don't want to see, uh, our judges certainly don't want to see a spouse receiving maintenance, you know, acquiring tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of new property. Uh, however, that it's the nature of the acquisition that's important. So if the spouse is actually using that maintenance money to buy those things mm -hmm. as the client alleges, then yes, judges would consider that. Um, but the first thing I'm going to ask the client is, how do you know that she's using your money to buy those things? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, if she's getting these trips or she's getting these gifts uh, from a new significant other or anybody else, really, then that's going to substantially diminish your ability to prevail on a motion to reduce or eliminate that maintenance yeah. obligation. And then on top of that, you know, while lifestyle will be considered in terms of squandering assets and things like that, uh, courts also understand that even spouses receiving maintenance and spousal support, they have to live their lives mm -hmm. and they have to be allowed to live their lives and they don't really want to get into the business of micromanaging how someone uh, lives their life. So it, those um, lifestyle choices that uh, are need a lot of money to be made they have to be pretty grievous to have much impact on the judge. So every guy asks, how do I know when I should go back? Because I don't know what she's making. I don't know what she has. I don't know what she's been doing. Her, she keeps her life secret. And on the other hand, I don't want her to have access to my finances because I don't want her to know I'm making more because it's all about her making less or doing nothing, which brings up the secondary question is, is does she, does X or he, whomever, have an obligation to better themselves? So I know that's a two-part question, but let's start with the first. When, how does a guy know when to file a motion to modify? I mean, is it just guessing and hoping? Any thoughts? Um, that's a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. um, it's hopefully the spouses have maintained enough contact that they have at least, you know, a, a vague idea of what is going on in that ex-spouse's life, you know, whether w at least whether or not they've attained employment or um, have even been looking for a job. Uh, but as far as, you know, getting that hard and fast information, that's what every attorney wants. But in those circumstances, it can be very difficult to come by. So mm -hmm. that might that might be a situation in which you could consider hiring a private investigator to mm -hmm. uh, just spend a little time getting a little more details on, you know, the ex-spouse's lifestyle and how they are spending that money. But you know, that can be a very expensive proposition in and of itself, just hiring that um, mm -hmm. private investigator. So yeah. 
unfortunately, I don't have a great mm -hmm. answer to that question. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's just a, a tough call that the attorney and the client have to make based on the information that's available to them and the information that they're able to acquire once they've started grappling with this decision. Yeah, typically I know it, it is. It's a million dollar question. And, you know, I tell my clients, look, it, it is you, you, until we get into the discovery, until we can subpoena her records. But, you know, if I could tell you and counsel the clients well in advance, it would be, hey, just one, be nice in the communications. Try to just listen. Maybe drop a question, you know, you know my job's tough. How's your job going? Just try to bait them into giving you information or become friends with their friends. Facebook friends, follow Facebook, whatever it is, Twitter, get more information well in advance because it is a little dangerous filing the motion when you don't really know on the hopes and expectation that there is a substantial and continuing change. So it is a very difficult question to answer, but that's why you ask a bunch of other facts. What has she done you know, in life? Is she going back to work? What's your situation like? And for many guys, I know Missouri, and it may be very Missouri specific. Um, the clients that I've handled, we have made it zero about their income, meaning that it's, we do that intentionally because most of the guys either their income has gone up or remained the same, but predominantly it's increased. And so they're afraid. They don't want to turn over their records. They don't want to make it about their income. You know, I had a judge one time use this phrase that the amount of maintenance that my guy was paying was like a pimple on an elephant to what he was making. And so I never forgot that uh, because keeping in mind that when your client makes more than the judge, whatever he's making is going to be a problem because the judge is going to say you can afford it. And so many times I tell my clients, okay, we're not going to make it about you. We're not going to say that you can't afford it. We're going to agree that you can afford to make the payment. The point is, is that she's either done nothing to improve herself or her expenses have decreased or she's living well outside of her lifestyle and, you know, wasted money. So that's kind of some of the advice I give to clients is there is a way, at least in Missouri, we can make it less about you and more about her. And so it is about listening and gathering information. So, and we've talked about you know, there are just briefly mentioned the notion and the expectation that if you file a motion, like in anything, whether it's a motion to decrease child support, you're going to get hit with a counter motion. Um, in your experience, what does it take if, if X files a motion to increase support for alimony when you're looking to decrease or terminate it? What does she need to prove? Is it the same standard? Or in, in Illinois, um, the one good thing about mm -hmm. this statute is that it is pretty much a numbers game. Mm. Uh, so the other factors don't really get taken into consideration. The lifestyle, has she bettered herself, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, those arguments I've made, and unfortunately, it is a numbers game in all the cases that I've had uh, taken to trial. Mm. Um, it's gross income minus gross income, and here and if, it, if the number's gone up, guess what? Your maintenance is going up. If the number's gone down, Maybe we'll give you a, right. a reduction. Any way to do, to defend against an increase even when you've got a formulaic way? I mean, is there any way to, I'm going to say massage the numbers or what, what does a guy do? I mean, because it, it, guys will say, well, I feel helpless. If it's so purely formulaic, what, what do I have? Why do I need a lawyer? Right. So you go through those 14 factors and you try to show why those guidelines um, would be inappropriate. Um, and and you and you put that evidence on, and you know again, this law's only been on the books for two years now, so there's mm -hmm. not a whole bunch of case law, but there is some case law, and that's what you that's what the case law says is that you can make the argument that these guidelines, this numbers game, is inappropriate, and here's the reasons why, and it could be based on lifestyle, it could be based on you know maybe the assets she's given, um, or you know you know, and, and try to, to make that argument mm -hmm. um, and, and do that same thing for a modification. Right. Experts. Uh, so I will tell a client every time we talk about maintenance, and I know it can be, again, Illinois perhaps being the exception, you cannot win a motion to modify or terminate maintenance without an expert. That's just my opinion. And I want your thoughts, but the type of experts I've used are uh, and I'm a huge fan, both in the divorce and in, in, in your modifications, uh, whether it be anything you're modifying, is a vocational rehab expert. Um, someone who will come in and talk about what can mom earn, uh, what is she capable, what's her education, and here's the work, uh, the workforce, here's the 
15 open jobs that fit her criteria, and here's how much she can make. And I know we've talked about imputation of income perhaps not being relevant in some states, but what is your experience? And, and there are all kinds of experts, accountants, uh, actual uh, employers looking to hire. I used a nurse. I called uh, Barnes Jewish here locally, got their head nurse, their hiring recruiting nurse. She testified about 10 open positions when I had a nurse who said she couldn't find one. And I said, here's a um, prospective candidate, which happened to be X, showed him the resume. I said, would you be interested in interviewing and potentially hiring? They said, absolutely. I mean, that's the kind of things that you need. So your experience, I just want to hear kind of your thoughts in using experts and what kind of experts are out there? What should guys be considering? And it is an added cost. And then lastly, do you find that it's an absolute necessity? So I'll open it up to you both. Another type of expert that I've used is a medical doctor. If, mm. if either party, I mean, sometimes one party who's requesting maintenance um, puts at issue their medical um, records, hire an expert, have them look, do a physical examination, do some type of of examination in regards to what what they're claiming um, or if your clients claiming hey I can't work as much my incomes down um, that's another type of person that you can call yeah. um, I had a case maybe not an expert per se but the terms of the of the judgment had the other party was to complete their associates degree within three years mm. if they did that then my client who was to pay an extra year of maintenance she didn't complete her associate's degree. We called um, and had somebody testify from the college. She, her claim was that the courses weren't available. They didn't offer. They didn't correspond with her work schedule. We were able to get somebody in to testify to say, nope, here's the classes. Here's when they were all offered. In fact, they were even offered online. Right. And we're able to show that she didn't comply with the terms of the maintenance and therefore my client didn't have to pay that extra year maintenance. Hmm. Well, Dylan, any experts that come to mind? Um, I'm sh so as with any legal issue, there could be, you know, a specific circumstance where a peculiar expert is uh, beneficial to the mm -hmm. client's case. But the primary ones that I encounter are the vocational expert, medical doctors, and also forensic accountants. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that you know, 90% of the experts that are used in maintenance modification yeah. cases are one of those three. Yeah, forensic accountants. I mean, I'm a huge fan because one of the things that, at least in my cases in Missouri when I tried, you have to prove what her available net income is, how, how much money she would have available to her to meet her reasonable needs and expenses. And so that's the challenge is if I can get an accountant to come in and say through X employment after the voc rehab testified, this will provide X dollars, which meets every single penny of her expenses. Because your guy can't just testify to that. Again, he said, she said. You can't present. You could try to present evidence of it, but it's just more powerful when you get an accountant involved. Uh, the forensic part, they can investigate what the expenses have been, what has she been doing, spending money. There's just so much opportunity, and especially when so much is on the line when it relates to permanency of alimony. And so I have to have guys look at the big picture. So when you're thinking hearing this and you're, I know what you're thinking is dollar signs all this is costing me a fortune well in reality if you don't modify and there's certain timelines I mean I tell guys as you're approaching retirement you're running out of time to get this thing potentially decreased or terminated but the point is is that you have to look at the big picture it may be a lot up front and we but we look at kind of the, the landscape and say, all right, how much am I going to spend on maintenance for another 15 to 20 years compared to what would I spend in fees and experts? And so long as that's, you know, the appropriate balancing, then, yeah, you're going to do it. But I just am a big believer, and I always have been and always will be, that you can't successfully put on a case to appropriately. I mean, lawyers do it, but I, I just think if you're going to spend the money, do it right and give yourself the best chance of success. And that's using some of the experts that we have used at Cordell that we know are very good and, and judges expect and accept their opinions. So um, any closing thoughts or any kind of tips at all that you want to give guys, whether they're either seeking more alimony or seeking to lower it or terminate it? Again, it can, for me, again, it's always about documentation, preparation. So any final thoughts, final closing thoughts? Uh, be mindful of your social media usage. Mm -hmm. So if you've had an increase in income, I'm sure that you're enjoying a different lifestyle and 
Uh, a lot of people in this day and age want to share that lifestyle with their closest friends and family, but understand that that information is not just available to your closest friends and family. So if your ex-wife sees that you have a new boat or a new car or a new house or mm -hmm. any number of new possessions that could, uh, if for no other reason than just because she feels jilted that she's not a part of that new lifestyle, that could very well prompt her to bring about an action to increase that maintenance obligation, you know, commensurately with your increase in your income. So just... Mm -hmm in any legal proceeding, particularly in family law, obviously, be mindful of social media. If I had it my way, my clients would never use social media. <laughs> right. But I understand that that's impractical today. Right. So I, in every meeting, first meeting I have with a client, that's one of the first things I talk about. Right. I think one thing to keep in mind is to have a discussion about maybe some type of settlement. Um, if if it works, mm -hmm. um, because you can perhaps, depending on the length, especially in Illinois, mm -hmm. you're looking at the length of your marriage, you're looking at the calculation, and perhaps you can uh, strike a deal where you pay something more and get out of maintenance. Because mm -hmm. once maintenance is waived in Illinois, it's forever waived. She can't come mm -hmm. back or he can't come back and get it. Um, whereas you might pay a little less because you're giving them cash. Yeah, up front right. than paying long term. And then you don't have to worry about five years from now if something happens. Now, there's um, pitfalls to that as well. There's some disadvantages per se to that. But I think that that's something that you have to have a discussion, a frank discussion with your attorney about. And even if you negotiate a settlement in regards to paying maintenance, keep things you know, whether or not you want the term reviewable, non-reviewable, those discussions need to happen. Because if you have a judge enter an order you're limited in what you can do but if mm. you agree to it you can take into consideration your retirement right. and those are just things that you need to make sure you have a discussion with your attorney about great well as usual as last month wonderful great advice and i hope it helped uh, many guys out there uh, again until next time uh, i'm scott trout ceo of managing partner cordell and cordell have a great week Thank you for listening to the Men's Divorce Podcast presented by Cordell & Cordell. To schedule your appointment with a Cordell & Cordell attorney, please visit CordellCordell.com or call us at 1-866-DADS-LAW. Also make sure to visit our partner websites, mensdivorce.com and dadsdivorce.com and download our free Men's Divorce Source app available on the App Store for the latest divorce news and resources. Cordell & Cordell a partner men can count on.